Hey, we're live. Welcome to another uh, live Q&A here on the Wood by Wright. So I am looking forward to doing this. I'm going to be answering your questions today, and I would love to hear what they are. So if you have any questions, leave them in the chat, and I will try and get to as many as I possibly can. Uh, if you are watching this and it is not live, then look down in the description. I'm going to leave a timestamp uh, by all the questions, so you can go to generally where those are. I, I just move them to the nearest minute. So if you're looking for a particular question, you see it in the, uh, the, the description down below, you can follow it there. So for those of you who are live, go ahead and leave your questions in uh, the chat and I will uh, try to get to as many as possible. I am going to be recording all of these. So um, if I pause for a moment to write things down, that is why. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, oh, wrong button. Ah, just lost something. I hope I'm still alive. Yes, I'm still alive. So um, Lots going on in the shop. I just put out a video today on making the uh, uh, the tool rack for all of the marking tools and things like that that I have. That was uh, actually it's going pretty well. Apparently, people like the uh, like the video, so that has been a, a fun one. I'm looking forward to the rest of this week. I'm going to be making more of the the storage items uh, and uh, having a little bit of fun with that. Uh, so I'm going to be making a rack for all of the auger bits and uh, hand braces and drills, and that should be coming along. Hey, Krat, 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 C-R-A-H-T. I'm probably messing that up, but uh, good to have you here. <clears throat> if any of you anyone has any questions, leave them in the discussion, and I will get to that. Uh, I've had a few people asking me about the... Uh, um, I have the, the main beam sticking out uh, from the rack that I built today, and it looks like it's going to hit my head, but it's it's not. It's actually um, back far enough so that it's uh, not endangering my skull, because as you can tell, I don't have much padding up here to begin with. Hi from Belgian. Ulrich, good to have you here, man. Uh, let me find, I have a list of a couple questions here. I just have to move them over. There we go. No, not that. There we go. Um, where did those go? I'm missing the questions that I was given earlier. So I guess if you asked me a question earlier, um, I'll try and get to it later. I don't know where I put them. Sorry about that. And uh, welcome to Patrick, Connor, and Richard. Richard, hey, you're uh, you're one of my uh, top commenters on every video, so thanks for that, Richard. And uh, from Norway, uh, from Normandy, France, nonetheless. Uh, Patrick asks, uh, what sort of finish should I use for coasters? I don't think BLO plus wax would work. Um, BLO and wax would work, uh, but you would constantly need to be reapplying the paste wax. Um, it, that's, it, it's not as good for um, general wear. Um, for any case where there is water, I my personal go-to is poly. Um, that's what I'll do my tabletop with. Um, and I made the the dresser that I recently made with with poly. All the trim in my house is uh, finished with poly. Um, I, I like the uh, the Minwax poly. Um, it's simple stuff you can get in any box store, but it will protect against water or the you know when your your cup sweats and it drips down. Uh, it wipes off easily, and uh, poly is a, is a is a great finish. Um, and I, I, I think a lot of people give it a bad rap because uh, some people think it has kind of a plasticky finish, but that just depends on how many coats you put onto it. I usually put four or five coats of wipe on poly and uh, uh, it doesn't have a very thick built up finish. It, it looks like wood, but still has a, a nice even sheen to it. Uh, I really like that. So yeah, that would probably be my go-to for, uh, for coasters is some um, wipe on poly. Hope that answers your question. I'm going to throw this into the list so it's in there. Ah, there we go. That would be at uh, 04. So all of the questions, I'm writing them out so I can put them into the description with the uh, timestamp on them. Uh, Connor asks, uh, what do you think about Japanese pole saws and planes? Um, uh, they're great. Um, they work fine. Uh, I, I think a lot of people have the, this weird feeling that it's either or. Uh, that you have to have, you know, Eastern or Western methods, 
And I think that's kind of a, a misnomer. Um, both work fantastically. Uh, both both do the work. Uh, they, they, they're just a different system. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, pulling or pushing, you're, you're going to be using different muscles, you're going to be doing it with different methodologies. Uh, pulling is great for enclosed things, uh, keeping things close to you. Where pushing, you can have something that's much longer, it can go beyond uh, what you're working on. Um, I think pushing, it requires more skill, um, especially with a saw. When you, when you push a saw, because the leading edge of the cut is on your side of the board, any slight movement in your hand will cause that blade to move. And you have to be very, very good at being able to keep the saw nice and straight and true and your arm in line. Whereas with the Japanese saw, it takes a lot of force to make that move uh, because the leading edge of the cut is on the, on the back side of the saw, uh, the back side of the board. Um, so it's generally running fairly true to wherever you set it. Um, and I think because of that, for a lot of people starting out, uh, pulling is easier. Uh, but once you get into it and once you, you learn the body mechanics, I find pushing to be a little bit easier. But it's a personal preference, uh, and uh, there really isn't one that's better than the other. Um, hope that answers your question. Uh, if not, let me know. Uh, from Kobe Spell, have you ever used um, Black Locust? Uh, no, I have not used Black, lo black Locust. Um, there are a lot of woods out there I've never used and would like to, but that is, that's definitely on my list of, yeah, I'd like to use that someday. Um... Have you ever used wood burning tool? And if you if you can make a video on that, um, yes, I have used a, a wood burner, like a, a small iron you can use to to shape things. I used to do a lot of leather work, and I would commonly use that for that. Um, I, I don't use it as much now because I'm all hand tools, and that kind of confuses people that you're using a uh, electric powered wood burner. Um, I do have a, uh, an iron that I use to put my logo on things that I heat up with, uh, with, with, uh, with fire as opposed to having it electrically heated. Um, but that's one of the reasons why I haven't done anything like that on my channel is because it's electric. Um, who knows? Might in the future though. Um, question from uh, Curtis Davis. Um, James, I, I pastor in Sydney. Uh, Sydney Northeast. And I am curious about your faith. Uh, you strike me as a Christian, and that, that's the case. Um, yes, uh, my, my father was a, uh, a, a Baptist pastor um, growing up and moved all over well, all over the country. <laughs> um, and uh, the church I currently go to is uh, Independent Fundamental Baptist. So I guess that answers your question. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm from the UK. Uh, if you guys leave a question, if you can put the word question before that, um, that would help me out at identifying rather than just chat. So I'm not reading through all the chat to find the questions. Uh, otherwise, I end up doing this. Um, Makija Wallencheck. Wallencheck. Sorry, I'm the worst name butcher there is. Um, he saw a version of a, a pole lathe that had some sort of elastic string going along the top instead of a wood pole. Um, do you think that is worse than yours? Um, no, um, no, that's a that's a bungee lathe. Uh, uh, and they, they, they work great. The only downside is you need a higher ceiling in order to put that up um, because the, the bungee itself needs to sag a good bit before it gets into enough tension to pull it up. Uh, so you have to have a certain amount of ceiling clearance. And because my shop ceiling is just a little bit over my head, um, I can't fit that in my shop. So yeah, um, doesn't work for me, but uh, good question. Uh, I do have several other lathes that I want to build. I've had several people asking me, why don't you put a flywheel on your lathe? And uh, that's because if I put a flywheel on my lathe, then it would be a flywheel lathe and not a spring pole lathe. <laughs> um, and I do want to build a flywheel lathe uh, sometime in the future. But uh, spring pole lathe is just uh, simpler, quicker, and a lot of fun. Uh, learning to play with the reciprocating uh, movement is, is very enjoyable. And I, I kind of like that. And uh, Merry Christmas to you, Christer, Christopher. And uh, looking forward to the Christmas season. Have you ever considered doing workshops? This is from uh, Zachariah Johnson. 
think I actually got that name right. I probably butchered it. Sorry, Zachariah. <laughs> uh, yes, actually, I have thought about doing uh, workshops. Uh, uh, I, I, I've thought about having over four or five people in my, my shop and, and doing something on my couple benches. Um, I've also thought of uh, teaching a couple places. I, I did teach once at a uh, woodcraft. Uh, that was kind of fun. Um, sometime in the future, yeah, definitely would love to. So if you're in the area and would be interested in that, let me know. And uh, maybe we can uh, get together sometime. Uh, Lemon Grass Picker says, Hey James, just curious what your first ever hand tool only project was. Um, my first ever hand tool project, the first big project was building uh, a coffee table. And I finished that uh, two Decembers ago. Um, my first decent project was building my bench. Um, so building the, the, uh, it made a, a two by four laminated bench, um, out of construction, construction grade timber. Um, but in order to build that bench, I ended up building several tools. Um, and those were all, um, hand tool made. So uh, I'm trying to think what the first tool I made was, I think making a beam clamp was my first actual all hand tool construction i think that was it because i made i made the clamps in order to clamp together the laminated top of two by fours um because i didn't have the money to go buy um actual clamps so i i i made them and uh yeah if you don't have the tools you need that's not an excuse just make the tool uh, i found when i was making my first bench i i was i was making tools to make tools in order to make the bench which is actually a tool in order to make what i want to make um so yeah have have some fun making some things um but yeah i think the 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 uh, coffee table in my living room was the first major build so i'm, I'm planning on doing several more uh, furniture builds i want to do um a, a end table um i want to do my own take on a shaker style end table um, kind of in the same style as the dresser that I made with the uh, the show tails, and I have a few modifications to that I want to make. Um, do that in the drawer. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, to hopefully starting in on that next week. We will see though. Um, do you ever get bored of white oak? I don't know how you can get bored of white oak because every single board is different. Um, now, the white oak that I play with is not the average white oak that you are going to find in different places. Um, that's because it is like the subgrade. It is common number two, common number three. The really junky stuff with a lot of a lot of twisting grain, a lot of knots, a lot of a lot of stuff that most people throw out is defects. And I love that in, in white oak, you, you get a lot of that, especially in like your swamp oak. Um, you get a lot of this very twisting wild grain. And that makes white oak so much fun because every board you touch is different. You have to learn about the board. You have to learn about how it's working. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why I use a lot of white oak. Because I really like that, that twisting pattern you get from the cheap stuff. And uh, it ends up bringing in a lot of color and uh, intrigue into the pieces. Um, but that being said, I do use a lot of other woods. Um, I, like I've recently gotten into a pile of hickory for all the trim, and so I have a lot of cutoffs from that that I'll be using in other things. Um, the, uh, the table, uh, my dining room table I want to build, I'm thinking about doing that out of elm and walnut. Uh, I think those two would be a fairly interesting contrast. Um, I still have to buy the, the main piece for that, but I have three slabs of elm that I'm curing that uh, should come out. Um, but white oak is still my favorite. It is not an easy hand tool wood. It is a very difficult hand tool wood, um, but I think that is part of it that makes it fun. I, I like things that aren't simple. I like things that aren't just easy. I want them to be a challenge. And I think that's one of the reasons why I like a spring pole. It's challenging. It's it's something that is, is always... Um, pushing my limits. And I, I like that about it. Uh, CWP asks, what are you making next? Um, I'm hopefully starting on the end table next week. Um, and then hopefully after that's done, then the dining room table. Um, so I've got a, a bunch of 
furniture projects coming up. Um, I'm probably going to be making um, a locker system with a, a bench on the bottom for um, shoe storage and the locker systems for my kids um, coats and backpacks and things like that. Uh, so that one might be coming up. Um, I have a desk that I want to build. Uh, I have a bunch of projects like that that I want to build. I'm just trying to get the, 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 the shop finished up and in a functional shape. Um, I do have a few other smaller projects, things I want to turn. Um, I want to turn a bowl on the lathe. Um, so a lot of things like that coming up. Lemongrass Picker asks, uh, what was your favorite ever hand tool project that you made? Oh man, you're asking me to pick between my kids. Who's my favorite child? Uh, that's just that's just about the worst question I could get asked. <laughs> um, biggest one that stands out in my mind is the dresser that I finished uh, earlier this year. That was phenomenal. Um, a ton of work, and I learned uh, an incredible amount of that. That was kind of the the first time I've ever taken a furniture project and kind of tried to make my own style. Um, with the, the the show tales on it and uh, some of the, the carving and intrigue into it, I, I really like how that came out. And I think that's going to show up more in the end table that I want to make. Um, I, I think one of the most interesting projects I've ever made was the first grooving plane I made out of a piece of firewood. That was phenomenal because it was one of those times where kind of the light bulb moment and uh, everything kind of made sense. I really liked that. Uh, I, I don't know if I could pick one project over another because I, I really like most everything I build. It, nothing I build is perfect, and I never try for try for perfection. Um, I never claim to do fine woodworking on this channel. I don't want to do fine woodworking. I want to do real woodworking. I want to have fun, and I want that enjoyment to be the key aspect, not the project. Um, and so I, I kind of look at a lot of the memories that I have in building a project, um, the lessons that I learned. And I, I think those, those lessons are uh, more important to me than the project itself. And so I, I don't know if I, if I can pick a favorite project because of that. Sorry. <laughs> Hand toolery. <laughs> I like the name. Um, what other YouTube channels are you watching lately? Any non-woodworking channels? Oh my word, yes. I'm, I'm, I think my list is currently at like 600 or 700 channels that I'm subscribed to. It's, it's something fairly large and ridiculous. Um, I don't watch them all. I get notifications from them all. And so I, I go through my email list and anything that kind of piques my interest and I watch that. Um, Non woodworking, um, the Samson boat uh, project is uh, uh, um, a guy in, I want to say Washington State, Washington State. Uh, he has this old boat from 1910s uh, that he is restoring, and it is a pile of rotted wood. Uh, it is. <laughs> uh, most people would look at it and say, you know, put a torch on it, a torch on it and build a new boat. Uh, but he's taking this whole this old beast apart and I would really like to take a trip out there and work with him on that. Um, uh, just a beautiful, beautiful project. And even that is woodworking though. Um, other things recently, um, click spring. I watch a lot of that. Um, uh, I watch a lot of running videos. My hobby now that woodworking has become more of a business for me, um, I've chosen the new hobby of ultra running. Um, and so I watch several videos on that uh, ginger runner, um, uh, becoming ultra, uh, I, I do a lot of that. Um, I also, uh, listen to audiobooks. Uh, most of the time when you see me with headphones on in the shop, uh, I'm listening to, uh, audiobooks. And currently my, the book series I'm going through is the wheel of time series. I'm, I'm book 11. It's my second time through that series. And I'm looking forward to being done with it. <laughs> But if you ever want to see the books I'm, I'm reading at the moment, um, I leave a link to the book that I'm currently working on in the description as well as my, um, uh, my grade for the book of how much I like it. Um, Krat, Krat asked the question, uh, what do you think about Narex chisels? Um, they are very popular in Europe. Um, they're a great chisel. Um, I, I think a lot of people put way, way too much emphasis in chisels and plane blades on the quality of the steel and, you know, how good are they? Uh, 
my go-to chisels are $7 chisels from Aldi, the grocery store. Um, my second ch set of chisels are from Harbor Freight. Um, two of the, the cheapest chisels you can possibly get out there. Um, I usually tell someone, choose a chisel on the handle. Uh, how does the handle feel to you? And that makes so much more difference than the type of steel. You know, a cheaper steel, you're going to have to sharpen it more, but it's still going to cut fine. Um, and that's the more you have to sharpen them, the more you get to learn it. And uh, chisels are so fast to sharpen. You don't need to jig them up. You can just quickly run them over a stone and 30 seconds later, you're back at chopping. So I, I don't think that's much of an issue. Uh, but as to Narex, they're, they're great chisels. Um, uh, I, I like them. Every time I've gotten a chance to use them, uh, they're they're good. Uh, they, the steel on them is, is very good. It lasts, lasts a decent amount of time. And uh, I think for the price, they are the, the best bang for the buck and higher quality chisels. Uh, so yeah, definitely. That's probably one of the projects we're doing soon. Um, the thing I, I, I don't like about the Aldi chisels are the handles. Um, I like their size. I don't like their shape. They don't feel very good to me. So I'm probably going to be making new handles for them soon. And that should be a lot of fun. Uh, John Early asks, uh, where did you get your mark maker's mark? Uh, I'm guessing you're assuming you're um, asking about the uh, branding iron that I use. Um, and I ordered, uh, well, excuse me, I designed the head itself in SketchUp. And then I sent it off to um, a 3D printer who printed it in a stainless steel. Um, the, the guy I went with doesn't exist anymore. Um, and so I just printed it so that on the back of it, there was a quarter inch um, rod basically sticking up out of it. And I tapped into that quarter inch threads and then put on a long nut and made a handle for it out of a quarter inch bolt. And uh, that works. Uh, I, I want to make another one. I want to make a slightly larger one. Um, and I haven't used it in a while. And I probably should. But uh, when I make that slightly larger one, I'm probably going to do a video on making it. That might be uh, useful. I made that back when I wasn't quite making videos for the sake of other people's knowledge. It was more for my own documentation. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, i sorry. I don't have a video on making that. <laughs> uh Zachariah, Zachariah Johnson asks, have you ever considered doing workshops? Um, I thought I just asked. Oh, yeah, you just doubled it up. Okay, sorry about that. Um, how much chunk would, how much chunk could a wood chunk, woodworker chuck if a woodworker could chuck wood? I could do as much wood as a woodchucker would chuck. Yeah, um, skip that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Richard Ritter asks, uh, flywheel means it spins in the same direction? Y um, yes, um, a flywheel lathe, um, both a flywheel lathe and a spring pull lathe are, are a treadle lathe. They, they have a, a pedal that you step on. Um, a, a lot of people think the flywheel lathe is a treadle lathe. And yes, a flywheel lathe is a treadle lathe. Um, but to distinguish it from treadling, um, it's called a flywheel. So you have a large flywheel that you basically put energy into by stepping on a pedal to run the flywheel. Um, or you're on a bicycle pedal where you're, you're, you're pedaling for it. Um, and the flywheel stores up energy. And then you have this large flywheel and a belt goes down to a small pulley on the shaft so that the workpiece is always rotating in the same direction. Um, and so yes, flywheel um, lathes always run in the same direction, so they're more simple, or they're more complex, but they're easier. <laughs> uh, oops, sorry, I moved that down. Lost where I was at. Every now and then, all the uh, comments jump, and I have to work to keep up with them. Three. Uh, question do you think a standard um i think pmv 11 steel could be used to make a wood scraper plane um this is a question from sean gibson um well pmv 11 is not a standard steel that is a steel that uh um, veritas particularly likes um it is uh it's what I have in my, my Veritas com, um, 
custom hand plane. Um, I really like it. It, uh, it tends to to last very long, um, but still being relatively easy to uh, uh, relatively easy to 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 sharpen. And uh, yeah, uh, but yes, that would work very well on a scraper plane. The only problem you have to have is you have to have um, a harder tool to turn the blade on. Well, unless you're talking about like a like a, a, a toothing plane where the blade is vertical in uh, ah, tongue tied, a toothing plane um, where the iron is vertical in the in the work. Um, in which case, then you don't have to have a turned burr on it. Um, and you just sharpen it like a normal plane blade. Um, but if you're talking about like a cabinet scraper where you are um, scraping the top of the surface, you have to have a harder steel to turn the blade on, in which case you're probably going to want to buy like a, a, a carbide rod, uh, which is on my shopping list. I have a, a burnishing rod, which is very hard, hardened steel. Um, but if you're going to be working with a hardened steel for the, um, the, the cutting edge, you need something harder than it to turn a burr on it, where carbide rod is, is very hard and that would work great for it. Um, uh, Colby Spell asks, uh, do you use any other chisels other than the Harbor, Harbor Freight and all these chisels? Um, in my shop, no. Um, I've used them in other shops and for other people. I've also used, um, I've used the, uh, the um, Lee Nielsen chisels. I really like those. Um, I'm not as big of a fan of a socket chisel as a, as a plain chisel, as a um, tang chisel. <laughs> um, I, I like tang chisels over socket chisels, um, just a personal preference. Um, I've also used um, the, the new Stanley Sweetheart chisels. Um, those, are, those are actually really good um, if you like the, the socket chisel. Um, I would put them on the same, um, same list as uh, um, like uh, Narex, probably about the same quality steel. Um, I, I know a lot of people give the, uh, sorry, I'm trying to get these words down, so I'm splitting my brain power. <laughs> I know a lot of people kind of um, poo-poo the, the new uh, Stanley Sweetheart line as being inferior and low quality. And I, uh, I have to disagree with that. The, the ones I've used, they are a lower quality than general use, but they are far cheaper, and that makes um, all the difference. Um, and the, the quality difference is not enough to really cause much of an issue. So I really like the, the, the Stanley Sweetheart stuff. Uh, can you show us where you cure your wood? I'm trying to figure out the best way or place to set it. Um, actually, yes, it's behind this wall um, underneath my stairs. So this is my stairs. They, they start down here and then they go up that way. And so all of my wood rack is in the stairs here. Um, I have a video on my second channel about making the wood rack there. Um, but I store uh, the long planks on the bottom on the floor here. Um, and I have a fan built way back here in the corner um, that I can circulate the air in there occasionally. So I'll turn on that every now and then to circulate the air. Um, you just want to store it in a place that's dry, but not too dry. Um, like I've had some people, you know, think about putting it in their attic where it's really hot and dry. Um, and in that case, you may end up case hardening the wood. In other words, you dry the outside, but not the inside of the wood. Um, I like to put it in a place that is relatively dry and slowly, slowly, slowly dry it. So those boards have been sitting down there. Uh, the ones I'm talking about for my table have been there for almost two years now. Um, they're four quarters thick, and uh, they're, they were probably dry about six months ago. Um, I just haven't gotten around to working on them. So wherever you can find out of the way um, that is dry, uh, not too hot, especially if you're air drying it, um, unless you want to kiln dry, and then you have to be very careful about the percentage of heat and whatnot. Um, but I like just simple, slow air dried. The wood works so much easier and so much better. Um, at least my personal opinion. Oop, let me put that over there before I forget. Uh, that was uh, from Zachariah Johnson as well. Oh, no, that was not. Um, that was from Gary Bush. Throw that over here before I forget. Uh, 28. Um, ooh, jumped out.
Um, yeah, Mike uh, Bradley asks about uh, in the cold. He's from uh, Minneapolis, and uh, can you address winter woodworking conditions? For example, wood storage, tool storage. Uh, what do we need to keep inside, such as glue or what else? Um, basically, my rule of thumb is if it's liquid, um, keep it where it's not going to freeze. Um, so yes, I know that a lot of other things are going to be perfectly fine in the cold weather, um, such as your alcohols. Um, I, I just prefer to bring it all inside and, and be safe. Um, so anything liquid I keep inside. Um, I'm in the blessed, the blessedness of being in a basement shop. Um, so my shop is the same temperature. It's air conditioned all year round. And that makes everything so much simpler. Um, as soon as you go into a garage or something of that nature where the humidity is constantly changing, the temperature is constantly changing, um, you have to be thinking about wood movement. Uh, you have to be thinking about condensation on uh, metal surfaces and uh, rust becomes an issue. Um, when it, things get cold, um, and the, in the past when I've had a, a garage shop, um, I rarely ever heat the garage much more than like 45 or 50 degrees uh, because I don't want such a wild temperature swing. Um, I prefer to, to, to keep it on the cold side. Um, particularly in that case, you want to you, um, you want to be able to keep your wood in the garage for a while before working on it. Let it acclimate to the the, the current condition of the garage. Um, yeah, it, everything just becomes a little more difficult when you're doing that. And the more you can heat it, the more you can uh, the more you can keep it the same temperature, the same moisture. Things are just going to be better. Um, I think the the biggest problem for me was condensation. Um, if like, uh, if the, I, I have a humidifier in the house to keep the house a little bit more humid in the winter. Um, and so if I had the cold air in the garage, all the cast iron tools were cold. And then I open up the door to the house and all that humid air from the house rushes into the cold garage. Um, all of those cold cast iron surfaces are a place for that water to condense on and, uh, and rust. Um, so you have to be very careful about the the moisture you let into the shop. Um, but yeah, rust is probably one of the one of the hardest things with the weather swings. That question was from uh, Mike Bradley over here before I forget. 31. Um, Wanderlust Jake. Wanderlust Jake. Wanderlust Drake. Here's a question from him. <laughs> Rabbit planes. Do you prefer wood or metal or um, bodied and why? Or wood or metal bodied and why? Um, they, as long as they work, they work. Um, I don't really have a prefer preference. I don't have a metal bodied rabbit plane. Um, I've used many of them in the past. They they tend to be a little easier to set up for some people. Um, but uh, you know, whichever you've got, wooden bodies you can you can find rather regularly, and you can uh, uh, I think they're a little easier to find or a little easier to make. They're really not that difficult to make. Actually, I have a a video on making one from a year or so ago. Um, ah, it's not posting. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so yeah, I really don't have a huge preference one way or the other. If I had a, uh, a really solid preference, I would actually do um, a, a wood fill. I like the way they feel. A wood fill is a, is a metal sole, a metal sides, and then the middle core of it is wood. Um, and so the, the vibration that the iron gets while it's cutting gets absorbed by the wood. Um, whereas if you have an all metal bottle, that all metal body, that vibration just runs through the whole the, through the whole plane. It it it, it feels metal. Um, having that that wooden body uh, feels good, but having the wood having the metal sole uh, makes it run so much smoother. So whatever you got, um, you know, if you if you have the money to spend, I would probably go buy a metal one. Um, they're just easier to work with. Um, but if you don't have the money to spend, then a wooden one works just fine. Uh, tips for spacing dovetails. This is from uh, Vince Walpert. Walpert? Something like that. <laughs> um, honestly, space them how they look. Um, look for something that, that looks good. Um, I don't... 
there are so many people out there who have these specific designs for dovetails and particularly dovetails that you have to do them this way. They have to have this particular angle. Um, you know, hardwoods have to be a one to eight and softwoods are one to five. And then you have someone else who say something completely different or spacing and you have to have small pins. Um, you don't have to do anything. Um, do what you like. Uh, draw them out on a piece of paper and find out which one do you like, which one looks good to you. Uh, you're building furniture for yourself. You get to decide, and it really doesn't matter. Um, I personally like my pins and tails to be the exact same size. I like that that zigzag pattern where they're they're very very similar in in size and and, and shape. Um, but that's my personal opinion. A lot of people out there really don't like it. A lot of people really like the look of tiny little pins. Um, I, I I I personally don't like little pins. I, I just I, I don't know. I just find it weird <laughs> but yeah figure out what you like and go from there um there really is no spacing um there is no issue with one way or the other um uh question i can never find all these chisels when i go uh, when do they offer them um this is from ram chick pig <laughs> ram chick pig uh, uh there's a name in that story somewhere um they only sell them once a year. They used to sell them around Father's Day. Um, but then last time they sold them was about two months ago. So it's probably going to be a long time until they have them again. Um, so you just, you, you got to go to all these once a week and, and check them out. Because in some places they sell out the day they're put out. Um, my Aldi had a set of chisels that was there for like a week and a half. I usually buy a set that I then give away to people. Um, I think I have an extra set here in the shop still. Um, but yeah, you have to keep an eye open for them because um, you never know when they're going to come out. Um, uh, wow, lots of chatter here. Uh, sorry, trying to find the next question. Ah, question from Pale Dog Tool Company. And uh, if you've never seen Pale Dog Tool Company, you've got to go check out his channel. Um, I love, 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 love watching his videos. Um, he does editing and he does it right. Um, so yeah, definitely check out uh, Pale Dog Tool Company. Uh, but he asked the question, I've heard you asked, uh, what's your favorite tool? But I wonder what is your least favorite tool? Uh, what would you do? What do you hate using and avoid? Ah, uh, hmm. I've never thought about that. That's, that's actually a really good question. What is my least favorite tool? Mm. I hate loud tools. Um, so anything with power. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, doing the trim, I was using a table saw and planer and all the, the trappings that I used to have. And I, man, I forgot how much I absolutely hate using power tools. Um, it's just, uh, it takes all the fun out of the work. I don't know. Um, trying to think, you know, I, I think my least favorite tools are often my favorite tools as well. Uh, well, things like the compass plane, this thing is a terrible pain to set up. It is, it takes a ton of work to set up. Um, and it, uh, that part of the work is is something I don't look forward to. But once it's set up, it is so much fun. This thing is just, it's its cool. It's enjoyable to use. Um, and so I think, I, I feel the same way about like the Stanley 55. Uh, it takes work to set up and I don't like that part. Uh, but the actual use of it is fantastic. Uh, so I, I, I think, I don't know if there's a tool in the shop that I'm like, oh, I don't want to use that. Because if I find a tool that I don't want to use, then I use something else. Um, I don't use a tool if I don't want to use it uh, because I, I, I've kind of, I've built my whole shop around the idea of I, I use what I want to use. Um, everything I do in the shop is fun. If it's not fun, then I don't do it. Um, 
So I, I try and only pick things that are fun. And if there's a tool that I really don't want to use, then I, I don't use it. Uh, I think the only times where I don't like a tool is if it has a complicated setup or if it is something that I don't trust. Um, it's like a, a square that's out of square. Uh, you know, why? Um, just, yeah. So I, that's, that's a good question. Though. I'll have to think about that one in the future. Maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll come back with that one some, some other time. Um, Robert Her Herzog, uh, beginner looking in to build an easy, cheap beginner's workbench uh, that I may end up scrapping eventually. What kind of vice would you recommend? And uh, I try to build on my own first workbench. Um, well, the nice thing about a vice is even if you scrap the bench, you can always take the vice off and, and use it uh, on your next bench. Um, so you're you don't have to find a disposable vice, but that is something that uh, you may end up using for a long time. I personally like, um, well, here, let me turn my camera around and see if you guys can see this. Mm -hmm. Here's my mess of a shop. Oop, wrong way. Here. We are. So let's see. This vice right here. Hey, there we go. This is my old bench. And on that vice, uh, this is an end vice, a face vice and a tail vise all in one. And uh, that is, um, that's kind of the vice I, I recommend a lot of people get because you can do most everything in that. You can do edge planing, um, you can uh, turn it into a tail vise and flat plane on your bench top. Um, you can use it like a leg vise. Um, I've even do done dovetails on it. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very, flexible vice. The only thing it doesn't do is straddling work like a moxin vice um, because you have the screw and several guiding rods on the bottom. They're expensive. Um, I hit the jackpot buying that one for five bucks. Um, that was it was a Craigslist find for the centuries. Uh, usually those are around 100, 150 bucks um, and you're going to have to be hunting around. You'll, you'll find them at antique shops and things like that. Um, there's a couple uh, resale stores that might occasionally carry them. Um, but that is, is fantastic, especially if you can find one with a quick release that slides in and out quickly. 99.9% um, .9 of all your woodworking, you can do that one vice. Um, next, I would say a leg vice or a moxen vice, um, but then you can, you can get those vices as, um, as you need them. But yeah, that would be my suggestion for if you have to have one, that would, that would be the one. And, you know, if you don't want to keep your bench in the future, you can pull that off and put it on another one. Uh, it's it's nice to be able to have that. Uh, um, uh, here we go. Uh, John Treadway uh, asks, I'm having trouble sourcing materials. What are some options other than the big box store? Um, re I am reclaiming a barn as we speak, but I like to have other options from time to time. Um, how do you source your wood? Um, I actually did a video on this a while ago about uh, where to find wood cheaply. Um, I uh, probably 80 to 90% of the lumber I buy, I buy on Craigslist and I buy in large lots. Um, I watch Craigslist religiously for lumber. And every now and then, like when I say every now and then, I mean like once, maybe twice a year, there'll be a lot that comes up that someone inherits a barn and it's full of lumber and they just want to get rid of it and they're selling it for 25 cents a board foot. Um, or, you know, I'm moving, I've got to get rid of all this lumber, um, come make me an offer. And that's how I bought my large lot of white oak that I've been working on. And I'm almost through that. Um, a guy inherited a barn. It had 20,000 board feet of air dried white oak. Uh, most of it was a uh, number two quality and he just wanted to get rid of it. So he ended up selling it for, I, th I think it was at 25 or 50 cents a board foot. It was something ridiculous. And I bought as much as I could fit in my van. Um, when I went back for more, it was all gone. <laughs> uh, so yeah, watching for that occasionally. Um, I had another one, uh, where uh, it was a camp that had, uh, a whole bunch of lumber that they milled up. It was air dried and they wanted, 
I want to say they wanted like two bucks a board foot, which is a great price, uh, but was too rich for me. Uh, so I offered to make something for them. And so I did some carving for the pulpit in their, their chapel. And uh, uh, that was, that was fun. Uh, so I've, I've done a lot like that. I, I rarely buy specific lumber. I like to buy a large bo box, large, large lots <laughs> and then work out of the lumber I have on hand. Um, I, I make a lot of relationships with, uh, with local um, saw um, sawyers, you know, a guy in his backyard who has a, who has a band saw mill um, and he'll have a pile of lumber sitting around and all stuff that he just can't quite get rid of. Um, and I'll, I'll make a relationship with him and trade or um, like the, the hickory load that I recently bought um, was from a local sawyer and uh, he had a pile that he had uh, a guy had specially ordered um, it was all white hickory that he had hand picked out and it was great great quality stuff but the guy never came back for it and it sat in his shed for i don't remember how long he said it was there but uh, you know normally it would have been like six dollars a board foot for this particular um, lot and he ended up selling it to me for a dollar a board foot uh, which i was like yes please <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, uh, I, I don't buy any particular place. I just keep my ears open. And when that big lot comes through, I try and have, um, you know, a couple hundred dollars set aside in my lumber fund. And I just let that sit until I can buy a large box lot somewhere. Um, yeah, I, I I've only purchased lumber from the big box store well, other than like stud grade two by fours. Um, once or twice when I've needed a particular sized piece of lumber and I was all out and I just needed a stick of it. So I'd run to the store and buy a stick, uh, just time saving. Um, I've never purchased lumber from a lumber yard. Um, um, I just, I can't bring myself to, to spend those prices. Um, like my, my table boards are from a friend with a, uh, uh, with a chain saw mill and so i helped him mill up a bunch of boards out of one of his logs and uh, he repaid me by giving a couple of the the boards out of it so yeah um but yeah tearing down a barn that sounds like a lot of fun i, I had an opportunity to do that a while ago and i didn't uh, didn't do it um i just didn't have the time for it Uh, clicked on your channels tab and don't see your second channel. Um, my second channel is wood by right two. So if you just search, search wood space by space, right space two, um, you'll see my second channel there. It's the exact same logo, just blue instead of black. Uh, uh, let's see. Matthew Dobbins asks, uh, you have two planes a five and a five and a half how do you set each how do you set up each so i'm guessing you're asking if i only had those two planes how would i set them up um i would probably see if i could find a second iron um you know some old number four or number five and put a camber in it or even like go to harbor freight and buy a junky old iron uh, you know, a, a junky new iron from Harbor Freight, um, you know, one of the junk planes and, and put the iron in from that and put a camber in that and turn one iron into a scrub plane. Then the five, I would generally keep, I would either switch out the, the five for the scrub plane iron um, or keep it with a fairly deep cut regular flat iron um, and keep that one with a large mouth. Uh, for large stock removal. So scrub plane to take off a lot of material, the um, deeper cut iron for smoothing out the scrub plane marks. And then I'd probably use the five and a half as the smoothing plane, which I know goes against convention being a the larger plane, um, but I like the larger mouth for the smoothing plane. Um, and using that one for the finer cut, that way you can use it for your flattening procedures because for your flattening procedures or your your jointing procedures you want to have a uh, um, a shallow shallow cut so i'd probably use the the five and a half with the finest set so um hope that answers your question that's kind of an interesting question i've never come across someone with a five and a five and a half usually it's a four and a five um that tends to be the more common in which case i would probably make the the four 
into the smoothing plane and the five into the rough cut. Um, but I guess if you asked other people, you'd probably get other answers. So who knows? <laughs> uh, let's see. Hey, Fred, stop by to say hi. Probably a while ago because I'm still working my way down through the questions. Uh, can you make a molding plane from scratch uh, matching the body to the iron? Seems like it would be tricky. Um, oh, you know, so you're saying if you have the iron, how do you make the body for it? Um, that's really not that tricky. Um, I have a video on making a, uh, a tongue or, or grooving plane from a, um, a firewood block. And it's much the same principle. Uh, you're just going to be carving it down. Now, making the, the body... Yeah, I, I see your, your final detail because you, you end up having to carve that first surface. So usually what you end up doing is you make the body and then you adjust the iron to fit the body. Um, so you would carve the, the body as a plane um, or you would make the profile with another molding plane um, or with a mother plane. Uh, and then you would put the iron into the slot and you would use that, uh, you would use the body of the plane to scribe onto the iron its outline and then grind back to where you scribed. And so I guess you could basically do the exact same thing with an existing iron, um, make the body as close as you can to it. And then once the body is made and shaped the way you want it to, then you can scribe onto the iron uh, where it meets the body and then sharpen the iron back to that scribe line. Uh, it's probably the way I would do it rather than making it fit the iron exactly. Um, but who knows? I haven't ever tried that. So that might be, that might be fun though. Uh, 50. Christ. Oh. There we go. It did work. Trying to put all these over there. Um, Ram Chick Pig asks, uh, send the Aldi, send the Aldi chisel to me for a Christmas gift. <laughs> you know, I tell you what, um, send me your uh, contact information. If you pay for shipping, I'll send it to you. So yeah, definitely. I think I have an extra, I think I have an extra set in the shop. I might be wrong. If I do, I'm sorry. But yeah, contact me. I can send it to you. Uh, let's see, that was one. Uh, bring that over there. Ah, wrong one. Bear with me here a moment. Just trying to get all these copied over. There we go. Uh, who found the Aldi's chisel? Oh, you're asking who got one this year. How do you make a dog hole for your bench? Uh, this is from Danny Rajak. Kramar. Um, actually, I have a video that I put out probably about a year ago on how I drill dog holes. And honestly, what I do is I set up my brace and bit with the, with the, with the auger bit that I want to use, and I place it on the bench top, and I drill the hole. <laughs> that's that's it. <laughs> um, a, a lot of people make a, a big deal about making sure the dog holes are really nice and straight. And you want to make sure that they're vertical and they're a true hole. And honestly, that's a load of pile of junk. <laughs> that's, <laughs> you don't need to have your dog holes straight. Uh, even if they're out of true by, you know, a few degrees, uh, it's really not going to make much of a difference at all. Uh, if the dog is out of angle a little bit, it's still going to hold the wood. Uh, if you're using a hold fast and it's out of angle a little bit, oh, well, you're going to be cantering it in the hole. Um, dog holes do not need to be squared to the surface in the slightest. Um, and the amount you can, you can keep an auger bit straight is well within the, uh, the, the accuracy you need to drill a dog hole. So um, yeah, just drill a hole and uh, that's all you really need to do. Uh, I always find these videos really complicated about the people who uh, get a router jig set up so that they can plunge a router bit to, uh, uh, to drill the hole or they have this massive uh, contraption set up to make sure that it's big and square. Or I saw a guy once that uh, made a contraption so that he could move his drill press around underneath the bench. <laughs> I had to laugh. Um, yeah, you don't have to do that. <laughs> Uh, oh, you're asking, how do you set up the distances between the holes? Uh, whatever you want. Um, I have mine spaced at 
I think they're four inches apart on my current bench. Um, my old bench, they were six inches apart. Um, if you're using the dog holes for dog um, clamping, like you do on an invice, um, then the closer together they are, the less you have to move the invice in and out. Um, if you're doing them for um, hold fast reach, then put your hold fast in there and see how far it is out from the from the hole to the end of the hold fast, and then make sure that you can you can always pivot your hold fast to reach anywhere on the bench. Um, so. If there's eight inches from your hole to the end of your hold fast, um, then you're probably going to want like 12 inches in between um, dog holes so that the the hold fasts will overlap and be able to reach anywhere on the bench. Um, but I think as a general rule of thumb, most people it's about six inches, uh, but you really don't need as many as, as you have. The only reason to have a whole row of them is for a, uh, um, a, a dog clamping system. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so uh, how do you make a bench without any vice or other setup with just chisels saw available? What would you start with? Um, actually, that is what my channel started with. This is from Hans Ausbe. Sorry. <laughs> um, I actually used a folding table when I made my first bench. Um, it's just a, a surface that raises up. A lot of people uses, use saw horses. Um, and uh, I just clamped things to the tabletop. And it was, it was a pain to work with. It was not easy. But uh, once the bench is made, you don't have to worry about it again. Um, actually, for planing, I pushed the table up against the wall and used the wall as a planing stop. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, it works. Um, yeah, so I don't really overthink it. I, I started my entire shop with just a set of chisels, a plane, and a handsaw. And I went from there. Either I built tools, um, or I saved up the money to buy an odd piece here or there, um, or I made a, um, a great find on Craigslist or on uh, garage sales. Um, so yeah, you can do it with just a folding table. Uh, works fine. Um, even if push comes to shove, you can do it on the floor. I know of quite a few people who use the dining room table. Um, I know of one guy who uses the kitchen countertop. And that's his bench. Uh, because he doesn't have space for a whole bench, he just clamps things to his uh, his countertop and works on that. So there are a thousand ways. But if you want to see the way I did it, um, go back and look at my old videos. I have to warn you, my old videos are um, hilariously bad. Uh, I was making them for my own purpose and just kind of documenting what I did. Um, but I, from my first video is buying my first hand plane and I go through the first tools that I purchased and building my bench and building the tools I needed to build a bench. Um, so yeah, definitely go take a look at that. What's the cheapest way to sharpen a chisel? Um, uh, sandpaper right off the bat, um, sandpaper. You really don't have to go much more than like 200 grit, especially if you have a strop, um, just a hunk of leather to rub it on. Uh, but sandpaper gets expensive in the, in the end as you have to constantly be buying more sandpaper. Um, getting a two-sided whetstone, I think, is the, the cheapest in the long run. That's what I started with. Um, so those work fairly well as well. Um, I think I'm going to be stopping it here soon. So unless you have any particular questions you have, uh, feel free to list them. And I might get to one or two more here. Uh, what do you do? What do you do with plain shavings? Um, uh, you know, I used to decorate the flower bed with them, um, but my wife doesn't much like the look of white oak once it has tanninized and become dark. It just turns black. Um, so I just throw them in the back um, over the the fence. I have a, a a pile where they all rot down, and I spread them as a fertilizer eventually. So. Yeah, I just throw them out. <laughs> um, eventually, you make so many that you just can't uh, you can't keep up with it. So why even bother? Uh, that was one of the things. That initially, I was like, "Oh, I should do something with these," um, but oh well. Yeah, um, just let them rot. Uh, have you ever worked with Osage Orange? Yes, I have. Um, I've also worked with Osage Green. Uh, which is the root ball of Osage Orange. Uh, beautiful stuff. Uh, a pain to work with, but very beautiful. Um, really, really like that stuff. Uh, last question here, Wood Eagle 51. 
Um, I have my grandfather's bench vice. Uh, I like your blue one. How do I keep the screw and guides operating smoothly? I just regularly oil, regularly oil them about once every six months or so. Um, just keep them clean, and uh, they they generally they if the orifices they go through are tight enough, they will clean off the sawdust that accumulates on them. Um, but uh, once every six months or so, I just use like a, a three-in-one oil and oil up the screws and slides, and they work fairly well. Uh, sorry for the questions I missed. Uh, I know there were quite a few more, but uh, I got to... Uh, got to get going here. So this has been a lot of fun. Um, if I didn't get to your question and you would like me to answer it, send me an email. Uh, you can find a contact on my website, uh, woodbywrite.com, and I will gladly get to your question on there. Um, so definitely uh, send me the question and I, I love answering those. So anytime, uh, if you have any comments or questions, ideas, uh, feel free to contact me. I'd love to hear that. That's about it for today. And until next time, have a wonderful day.